All right, let's make another formal introduction for our listener. Uh, good afternoon, Peter. My name is Claudio. I'm calling you from Washington, D.C., uh, from the Swedish Fairfax City. We're very humble and grateful that Peter Ulrich accepted our invitation to the show. Peter, welcome back again. This is part three of our uh, yeah. interview. The long-running interview. That's Good right. to be back, yeah. Claudio. Hi. Yeah, more, more than interviews or conversation among two people that enjoy music. And yes, like music. absolutely. Uh, in, in, the, in, uh, it's, in this case, that can this. So the, the last time we, we spoke about, like a month ago, we were talking about Ion, which is the fifth album, right? Yeah. But that can dance that was released in 1990, but 4 AD. Yeah. And um, and I think it was recorded at... Uh, at Steve Perry, um, no, Steve Perry, Brendan Perry, a new state in Quibi Church in Ireland. And um, yes. feel free to elaborate on what memories do you have from that particular album and so on and so forth. Well, it was, uh, again, I wasn't involved in the actual recording of the of the albums at this point. I, was, uh, I wasn't involved in writing the material or, or recording. I was doing the, the live work. So um, it was kind of, once again, I got to hear the album uh, as as a fan would when it was pretty much uh, completed, um, and I I loved it. It's probably I would say it's uh, my probably my equal favorite album. I on I think uh, I, I really love the album, um, and uh, and I used to I really enjoyed performing the the songs that we did from that album when we did the the live shows for the when we toured it. Yeah, they have that album. For, have a lot of favorite tracks for uh, for, for me. It's uh, Santa mm. Relo's Call that became very popular. The uh, another track that we like, uh, Fortune Percent Gift, not according to the book. Yeah, and then I think you mentioned that in your in your book that you really uh, enjoyed and uh, were always waiting for as the bell rings. They had the maple spin. That was a favorite track of yours, right? Yeah, it was it was very different because it was the first time that I ever played um, electronic drums on on stage or anywhere, in fact. Um, and Brendan had uh, acquired this octopad. It's like, uh, as the name suggests, uh, eight little uh, pads on an electronic electronic board, and you can assign sounds to it. So I was actually playing um, on that rather than on a on the drum kit or on a percussion setup. Um, but the, the, the track itself is, uh, is, is like a, a sort of, uh, medieval reel of, of sorts. Um, and so Brendan's brother, Robert was playing bagpipes, um, like a, a, a very old form of, uh, <coughs> reproduction, uh, archaic bagpipes. And, um, yeah, it was just a. It just had a, a really lovely feel to it. It was a really lovely rhythm um, to to play, and uh, it was one that I always, you know, looked for it on the set list and enjoyed that one coming up in the in the set. Good for you. So as you were, uh, you know, playing with that can dance, you always you begin writing your own music and uh, putting some songs, you know, here and there, and eventually you say, well. I have two tracks or one track or four tracks, you know, what do I do with that? Uh, no. Sorry, where were we? Uh, we were that, I say that uh, eventually, so you, you were playing with Let's Condense and you begin writing your own song. Oh, yes, yeah. Right. So, um, yes, so, so Brendan had been passing down bits of equipment to, to me as he was upgrading his studio. So I, I had the... Um, some of the uh, some of the equipment that he'd been writing, like when he wrote uh, "Spleen and Ideal" and um, some of the uh, some of the uh, songs for um, "Within the Realm," uh, the equipment that he was using at that time, he he sort of handed down to me, and then he he'd upgraded. So I had uh, now had the facility to start doing my own uh, writing in a in a similar way, and obviously I was learning from the way he was uh, arranging music and so on. And um, yeah, so I'd started recording, a, writing and recording a few tracks and um, I decided to take the plunge and um, self-release a, a, a double A-side vinyl single. Um, so I made an arrangement with John Rivers uh, up at uh, Woodbine Studios where we'd done some of the Dead Can Dance recording before and... Uh, 
and went up and recorded a couple of tracks and that was uh, and and self released that in in 1990 so that was the two tracks takahara's leaving and evocation and how how difficult was to you know promote that and you know send to maybe record labels radio stations so uh it was uh, the technicalities of of of, uh, of promoting it were not difficult, but actually getting anybody to take notice of it and to get rid. Of it, whereas the, the the dead can dance name would obviously get you in the door anywhere. Um, going out under my under my own name, it was it was quite e even as the drummer of dead can dance, it was quite difficult to uh, get reviews published to get any uh, airplay on the radio for it. So. Uh, yeah, it was a it was a big struggle, um, and uh, in the UK because I'm because I've always been UK based as well. It was also very difficult doing it from from here because even at that time, Dead Can Dance was not such a big has, has never really been such a big name in the UK as it is in the states in many parts of Europe. As we were Latin talking America, about yeah. in Latin America. Um, in the UK, there's a there's a kind of a core audience in in London, but um, so gigs always sell out. But beyond that, it's it's a difficult market in the UK, and uh, um, yeah, I was I was I was really struggling to. I, I it virtually got no airplay whatsoever, and um, only a couple of very small reviews. What reviews it did get were very good, but. Um, uh, yeah, it just didn't get the the coverage, so it it struggled. Um, and then there's, I think you, you you might remember there was an incident in the in the book where we went on on tour with the Ion album uh, at, at the end of 1990. The first shows we did on that tour were in Athens in Greece. Yeah, and um, I <clears throat> I while while we were out there, I met a guy who uh, who subsequently became a good friend of mine who. Um, was running a record store in Athens at the time and told me that he had sold in his store about 70 copies of this single, which was at the time, I think, represented about a sixth of my whole worldwide sales. Wow. <laughs> and they'd all been through this store in, and I had no idea, but he was, uh, he'd just been promoting it and playing it over and over in the, in the record store and loads of people had bought it. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a it's a tough one. If you can get somebody who really gets behind it like that, um, you know, you can. It, it's all about exposure. Um, I, I've often wondered over the years if that if the single had uh, had received the sort of airplay that uh, you know the big artists get for their <clears throat> their stuff when they when it's released, if how well it would have would have sold. But uh, it's yeah it. <clears throat> it, it was tough um so eventually it became my because it sold so few copies at the time i i eventually included those two tracks on my on my first solo album right, almost right. a decade later because i still felt that there, you know it was i wanted people to hear those songs so yeah. um but yeah by, it's by, tough. By, by the way we'll, we'll talk about that album and is is yeah, the yeah. album still available online or your website or yeah the it it is um i don't know i'm not sure it's not in uh it's it's not in production at the moment as such by the the labels that did it but um there are still copies to be had uh, the cd came out on a on the american label project and i and they still have copies of it available yeah. uh, sorry this is the album or the single you're talking about uh both actually but more more well, actually, well, the, the, well the, 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 the album maybe you know a question on the, yeah, the, the the album is is certainly still the the cd version of it's available from project and uh yeah. the, it was a vinyl reissue of it on a russian label called infinite fog a few years back and um or only a couple of years back um and there are still i you know i think there there, there are some still out there uh yeah. But obviously, if um, if the book generates a new interest in in these things, they might uh, well, they release it. Sort of, yeah, putting you know running. In, de de definitely, I wanna uh, I wanna get a copy uh, for you to sign, and when we get together or something. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I've still got a couple of copies. Okay, that would be good. Save, save it, man. So, and also, I think you end up sending um, the record to uh, Peter Gabriel Studios as well, the Real World Studios. And, yeah. And then yeah, I've, always, I've, I've always been a fan of Peter Gabriel, and uh, yeah. I just thought that... Um, yeah, I thought there was no harm in just sending a copy along and see if it had any, made any any impression. Um, and so I I sent one to the Real World Studios in Bath, and uh, then I did a, a follow up and managed to get in touch with um, his uh, personal assistant there, and she sent me a, a very nice uh, letter back saying um, that he. Uh, Peter Gabriel was very busy with um, his current project. I forget what it was at the time, but he was very busy with that. And uh, hey, that should all calm down in a couple of months' time, and uh, and then he'd have a chance to uh, catch up with things. Cool. Um, and that was the last I ever heard of it, so who knows? <laughs> well, he's pretty good for releasing a, a new album uh, in the next two, three Yeah, months. yeah. Yeah, and, I heard about that. Uh, yeah. I... I uh... He's releasing some tracks here and there every once a month, and I, mm. it's pretty good stuff, actually. So, no, but you know, I mean, it, I, I, I don't. Uh, <coughs> they, it was just a, it was just a sort of off the cuff, uh, of course, you know, yeah. in in hope that something because because obviously, if somebody if somebody of his standing uh, picks up on it and then uh, you know tells his fan base that he's just heard this thing that he really loves. You know that gives you a, a huge boost, but um, of course, of course. I, whether he ever ever listened to it or not, I've I've no idea. But uh, yeah, I oh. still like his stuff. Yeah, of course I know. I know exactly what you mean. And, and little by little, at the, the time I was reading your book, that uh, the, you know, and like, of course in the nineties, I didn't know they condensed. I don't know who they were, but I uh, mm. the, the media so was treated a little bit the condensed as an indie rock band and some of the tribe were in the indie chart and uh, some people say that i don't know yeah label more like a neoclassical that were uh gothic music i don't know how you how you what's your your take on well that? That, yes that was the thing no nobody knew how to classify us at all because it, and and i mean we didn't either because it kept changing all the time I and mean, when, when yeah. we first when i first joined dead can dance we we were essentially a guitar based drums Band. I mean, we had Lisa's Yang Chin and a couple of other things, but it, yeah. uh, most of the music was guitar, bass, drums, and um, and we were uh, on Four AD, which was a which you know was uh, you know had uh, artists like Bauhaus and uh, Cocteau Twins and Birthday Party and and so on yeah. at the time. Um, so. Uh, we were, and in the UK, we were on the John Peel show, which was very much a, a rock music based show. Uh, our albums were in the independent rock charts, and we were largely still in in the first sort of three or four years touring the the rock circuit. So we were very much a, you know, we were an in, indie rock band as such. But then uh, by the already by the time of Spleen and Ideal, which was a second album. We were using all sorts of orchestral instruments and we had a stage show that had cellists and brass players and timpani drums and whatever on stage. And we, we it was, you know, we were already quite a long way from the independent rock circuit. Um, and then as it went on, we got into, you know, Lisa got influenced by the Bulgarian singers, as we've already discussed. Yeah. Um, we started... Uh, uh, listening to a lot more um, early music and bringing in those influences, as we've talked about on Ion, um, and uh, and it, it went through all these these different phases, and then gradually more more and more world music came into it. So we had the uh, Arabic percussion and influences, and uh, and <coughs> um, the djembes coming into the mix, and African percussion. Um, so it, it was it was just it was constantly evolving. Um, and it was, you know, it was very difficult to, to categorize, but the media and the, and, and the music distribution, uh, trade as well always has this thing where they have to be able to, uh, categorize the music. It has to yeah. be either rock or pop or jazz or whatever it is. Um, and it, yeah, it, it became a, 
it's actually it's actually a problem for when you come to marketing because obviously uh, if you think in terms of which radio or TV uh, shows or or newspaper critics you're going to they have their areas you know they've all got their rock programs and their jazz programs and their folk programs and a lot of the time Dick and Dance's music and and my own as it as it progressed fell into some kind of hole in between all these different categories and probably missed out on quite a bit of uh, coverage that we might otherwise have had because yeah. because we couldn't be categorized um so yeah we used to get uh, we used to get people coming up with all these uh, sort of weird classifications like uh neoclassical neo goth neo folk uh, whatever and uh, um it, it it ended up becoming so uh, so broad that it was it was pretty much meaningless. Yeah, absolutely. And then, so after you guys got together again, there were uh, different members. Was obviously at the time was Lisa, Brendan, Robert Perry, yourself, Peter Ulrich, uh, John Bonner, Joseph Burns, and James Lee. Right, they began yeah. rehearsing. That was the, yeah, the nineteen ninety two. Yeah. Yep. And then you guys did a, a mini tour in England. You did what five gigs in Middlesbrough, or Manchester, Nottingham, Brighton, and um, yeah, we actually five. didn't do the one in Brighton at the end. In the end, I'm not quite sure what happened to to that one. It wasn't down to us cancelling, but uh, really? that fell through. So we we actually only did four in in the end. There, but, okay. Yeah. And when they cancel, you don't you still get pay, or because it's not your control, or, or yeah. Uh, with that one, I really can't. I, I don't know what happened to it. I, yeah. I don't know why it was 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 cancelled, and I don't know what happened to the. the yeah. it, that was actually the first uh, first tour that we ever did, where we had a um, third party management for the tour. We'd all, we'd always done done our own tour tour management before, but yeah. we actually had, uh, <clears throat> um, yeah had had professional tour managers in on that tour, so. Um, they were handling all all that side of things, and I don't know. I I can't. Remember, I don't remember what happened with that. Yeah, I got it. And I think the the sales for that they were so loud. All of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I mean, there's a couple of uh, my. You you'll see the tail of my cat suddenly. Uh, pop yeah, it's okay. Up. Don't worry. <laughs> um, Maybe they got like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She's she's, she's very <laughs> musical. Um. Yeah, the. Yes, I think what happened was the the the. I mean, this this was classic uh, uh, UK stuff for Dead Can Dance. So the, when we the, the first day we did in in Middlesbrough in a small theatre in Middlesbrough was uh, was only about half full, and then I think the next night we played at Manchester University, and that was sold out. And then after that, we played a place in a city in the middle of England called Nottingham where uh, we played a place that was only half full. And then a couple of nights later, we played a, a 2,000 capacity venue in London, which was completely sold out. And we were told there were tickets being sold by Tails outside for £500 a time, which in 1990 was a lot of money. Wow. Um, wow. I've, you know, again, I've, this is just what we were told. I've no idea. I, I, sure. I don't know whether it's true or not. But uh, it just it always struck me as being completely bizarre that the... Uh, the Nottingham show uh, two nights before uh, was a, a capacity of about 600, which which was only half sold out and was is sort of two hours up the road from from London. And then, you know, you play in London and uh, and the place is is sold out and tells are selling tickets for that much. I don't you know, it's a it's a weird thing, but the UK has always been like that for Dick and Dance. It's very, it's a very strange market for us. Yeah. Is it for for a musician for your point of view? So I, I don't know if you you get paid whatever the X number of dollars a pound per the show, or you get a percentage of the ticket because it's kind of it's hard to a little bit if you get no, paid the can, same amount it, and yeah, it can, it can the, be, the, you know, yeah, it can, it can work both ways. But in our case, I think we were. We were nearly always getting a just a fixed fee for the a show. Fee, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Because it might be a little disheartening for a musician point of view, seeing the the first ten rows, usually the more expensive one, empty. You get paid the same amount. It's a job you need to perform. 
for the next two hours. Yeah, but, but again, it's like a, as I said, it was never. We were never really thinking of it from a commercial angle. It was uh, there was yeah. wasn't in the in the thinking. Um, so if a if a theater was half full, it was just it was a, it was just a bit disappointing to look out into the audience and not see, yeah, um, you know, faces going all the way back. But still, I mean, you know, if you if you've got three hundred. 300 people in a in a place you're still if they're really into it you're still going to get a very good response and uh yeah you, you know it can still be a really good show um yeah. but uh yeah i mean obviously it's always nice to play to a, a place that's packed to the rafters absolutely man and then after that you guys uh you know put together the the toronto and the first tour well the first tour in, in canada and and here in the united states in 1990 mm. right so you did two weeks in canada and then in north america one two three four five six seven eight i think um feel free to elaborate on the electric equipment issue in 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 canada with the 240 volts version of them yep oh yeah yeah so we, yeah, the second uh, day we did in Canada was in Montreal at a, yeah. um, it was it was kind of a really strange uh, environment for us to play in because it was like a, um, a, a sort of cabaret club. It was, I think it was an old cinema that had been converted, but it was like it had been set up like a, a sort of cabaret club. So instead of having a an audience, either seated or standing audience. It was it was all these little round tables where people sat around the tables and having waitress or waiter service coming to the coming to the table. So it was a it was quite an odd environment for us to play in. Um, but then when we turned up there, we uh, we discovered that um, we'd been booked to we'd been booked as a headline act and. Julie Cruz had been booked as the support act and it was just at the time when um in between the time when the booking had been made and the time of the, and the date of the show she'd had this huge hit with the um uh, the theme from Twin Peaks David Lynch's uh, Twin Peaks yeah um falling i think it was called um so she she'd had this uh, like number one single all around the world and was suddenly a huge huge artist. But she'd been booked to play this. I, I don't know how many what, what the venue held, maybe about five hundred people or something. She was booked to play this this uh, relatively small venue. But not only that, she was the support act to us, and we were you know this was our first tour there. We were we were barely known in uh, in Canada and the states at that time. So. Obviously, the the management came to us when we got there and said, "Look, um, <clears throat> you know, given the circumstances, can Julie Cruz be the main act and you be the support act?" Well, we didn't care about the sort of hierarchy of the thing, but obviously, for <clears throat> as most people probably know, if you're the main act, you get the main sound check, and the support act gets whatever's left at the end. And yeah. we couldn't afford because we had a we, we had a pretty complicated stage set at that time. It was essential to us, so we had the uh, the 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 main uh, the main sound check. So Brendan said to the promoters, "No, we we you know we're contracted to be the main act, so we're we're sticking to that." So um, they, there was nothing they could do about it. So that that was it. So on on this night in. Uh, in Canada in 1990 in Montreal, we, we, we um, Julie Cruz, who was now a number one act all around the world, supported uh, Dead Can Dance, which was uh, quite a quite a strange uh, um, scenario. But then, <clears throat> to add uh, to the craziness of the night, we we discovered while we were sound checking that. Uh, um, because all our equipment was 240 volt electronics from the, which is the UK rate and everything in the, in the States and Canada is uh, 120. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. But <clears throat> that's usually not a problem because everybody's used to UK bands coming over with the, the equipment. So they have um, step down transformers, which convert, uh, which, which bring, reduce the, uh, <clears throat> the, the power. Um, but for some reason, the 
or no, sorry, it's the other way around, isn't it? They have step up transformers, which enables the uh, the equipment in the American equipment to be powered to the the level that's needed for the UK um, <coughs> UK uh, uh, equivalent. Um, but for some reason, the this venue, the the equipment they had there, only had the um, the capacity for one oh six volt instead of one ten volt to step up to <clears throat> to our equipment, which for the all the guitar amps and, and such was okay. But where we were using quite a, a few uh, computer, bits of computer equipment and, and electronic keyboards, they kept crashing all the time. Wow. So <clears throat> uh, we we actually had to drop out about half our, our set because we just physically couldn't, the keyboard player, um, John Bonner, couldn't, couldn't play a lot of the stuff so we had to do all the we did all the songs that we could do pretty much acoustically or leaving out the the keyboards and the computerized stuff and then lisa ended up uh, as she always she was always great stepping into the breach when there was any problems like this she just uh, buffed about four or five i think or maybe three or four songs <clears throat> completely impromptu just to uh to give the audience value for money in the in the show because we'd had to we we'd lost about um half the set wow. so yeah it was a, so overall a very bizarre gig that night but uh anyway it happened <laughs> my god and i would be i would be very mad because i, I like to things work well and that's how something like that could yeah be. no for no your end but on their end right they they are selling food, they are selling beer, they are selling, you know, merchandise or whatever. The, we should be up to, you yeah. know, yeah, the, was, you know, was, skill to decide, I mean, well, these bands are coming yeah. from another country. I mean, it's, it's not like we were the only band touring at the time with that kind of equipment. There were That's many right. bands. Yeah. It was very odd that they didn't have um, the capacity to, to cope with it. But anyway, who knows? Yeah, we're... Then you uh, from Canada, you did two gigs in Canada and then United States. Yeah, so and then we and now those States. are big venues, the Boston, Berkeley. Yeah, uh, I know Boston very well. Then you play in New York, then you get to Washington, DC. So feel free to elaborate on any of this. But what memories do you have for those games? Oh, just um, yeah, very exciting. I mean, really, for us to be in America for the first time was, was obviously exciting in itself. Um, and nobody knew really because we we didn't have any uh, distribution for our music in the in the states at the time. So nobody really knew um, how Dead Can Dance were were going to be received. And the promoters had taken a chance and put us into some decent sized venues. I mean, we were playing places that probably held four, five, six hundred people, um, and yeah, if you're if you're if you're unknown, it's not easy to sell that number. It, it sounds like small venues now, but it, but it's not easy to uh, to shift that number of tickets. But it seemed like everywhere was pretty pretty close to uh, selling out, if not selling out completely. And um, the responses we were getting were were really strong, and it was clear that people did know our did know some of our music, um, and were really. Uh, really reacting well to to what we were doing, so uh, so it was it was great from the right from from the you know as soon as we set foot on American soil, it was a it was a great experience. Um, so yeah, we did the the Boston one first, and then we went down to New York and did uh, two nights on Broadway. Um, so it, I, it was a small theater on. Upper Broadway, but anyway, um, it's not bad going to go to America for the, the first time and play Broadway. Um, and we had two two shows there, the two night two consecutive nights there that were both sold out, and um, and we got good return, got a review in the New York Times, and yeah, so it really seemed like uh, it was happening. And then we came to your home city. Yep. Um, and played that Gaston Hall that you know very well. That's right, yeah. That's and, uh, uh, your stand university. Yes, uh. Yeah, that was that was a gig that we had um, um, Linda and I 
I recall in where um, I saw a group of, I could see a group of, I think they were, I think they were all girls, a group of people on, there, there's like a, at the back of the hall, there's a, a kind of gallery at the at the back and there was some, uh, the audience were up on, on there looking down towards the stage and there was this group of about half a dozen uh, people on, on there all doing air yang chin playing. So, <clears throat> you know, just where Lisa was playing the yang chin at the front, they were all up there doing their um, mimes of hammer dulcimering on the uh, on the gallery at the back, uh, which I never seen before or since. Yeah, yeah, weird. Yeah, it's uh, Georgetown University is um, you know Catholic University was founded by Jesuits and uh, yeah, we are like a dark wave band, gothic band with weird sound playing there. <laughs> Of course, at the time, you know, yeah. uh, that, that was not known in the United States. So it's a kind of, you know, weird, weird, weird combination. But um, and then uh, so yeah, I mean, we, we yeah. had we, we had no input into the places that we played. We just we were just right. the uh, the tour itinerary and said, you know, you'll be playing here, here and here. So yeah, so yeah. that was it. We didn't have any, any input into that. And then from Washington, um, you went to Chicago, the big theater. Yeah, then place. drove up to Chicago. And then uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then you, you guys, uh, that was the end of the North America tour. You went back to Canada, right? But uh, now you, you, you played in, you know, good venues, well-known venues. More people got to know that can dance, and you guys went home. And then eventually, you know, with all the success, you... You know, with with your two uh, young children, you you decided, well, I need to. Uh, yeah, so it was pretty. It was pretty much at that point, at the end of that tour, um, yeah. that I decided that uh, I, um, yeah, that I I couldn't do the touring anymore. We, our, my wife was uh, pregnant with our, our second daughter, and um, it had become a bit. It was a bit difficult to. Um, to go away on the tours, leaving her with our with our other daughter, but with another one uh, coming along, and my wife uh, <clears throat> um, doing quite a, a a demanding job as well. It just you know it just got to the point where I, it was unfair for me to um, you know keep disappearing for three two or three months at a time. But kind of strangely, we. Um, there wasn't then another Dead Can Dance tour for three years. So yeah. I told Brendan and Lisa that I'd, I was going to have to bail out at that point. But then for all those, for those few years afterwards, it seemed like I hadn't, hadn't really left because they were doing some writing and recording, but I wouldn't have been involved in that anyway. And um, yeah, it wasn't until uh, 1993 that they they went out on tour again. So, uh, yeah, it was a like a, a sort of strange little um, uh, period where where nothing much was was happening, except that in the in the states in in that time, um, 4AD picked up a distribution deal through Warner's, um, and that really made the the sales of Dead Can Dance's music take off in the States because it suddenly had Warner's uh, promotion behind it. So there was a release in 91, I think it was, or 92 of um, a compilation album, Passage in Time. Yeah, it was uh, which was yeah. yeah, which was put out so the, the Warner's could, uh, could newly promote Dead Can Dance to, you know, through their, because there was nothing new coming through at that point. They, <clears throat> they use that as a as a device to um, to really promote Dead Can Dance into the American market, and then of course that made the uh, put the whole thing onto a, onto a different level. Yeah, I think at, at the time also into the Labyrinth was released in ninety three. In ninety three, yeah, and then, I think and that was the first out. album that emerged from the Quibi studio, and then um, um, I think it had. Feel free to elaborate on that. There's always very weird track for me. Of course, I like it, but it was the Yulunga, the the spring dance that had oh, yeah. put in Australian uh, uh, Aboriginal traditions, right? So, 
Yeah, yeah, which became a very popular uh, right. Deck and Dark track, a very big track for. <laughs> it's pretty much been kept in the live set ever since, I think. Far and like a yeah. Um, and always got down really well at concerts, yeah. That's right. And then you guys did the. Uh, the Nor went back to North America again, uh, played uh, the Roxy in Atlanta, Washington. Washington again. Yeah, so Canada, the, the, the tours started. Yeah, the tours started getting much bigger then. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, bigger venues, bigger, longer tours. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, they. Uh, so uh, they, they obviously in after my time with the band, they've they've done a lot more um, touring in in America over the over the years. Yeah. And then you did. You guys did the last three. Uh, gigs in Los Angeles, and then I think there was the, the last two shows were filmed uh, for a commercial release in '94, right? And I, yeah, so I that, yeah. that was kind of a little bit disappointing to me because yeah. you know, for me personally, because obviously it was the first tour that I hadn't done with them uh, for, yeah. for a long time, uh, and that was the one where they got to make the, the video, so um. Yeah. But yeah, you know, I was I, uh, obviously as a as a fan of the band, I was really happy to um, to have that and to see it. And um, yeah, it's a it's a night, it's a it's a great record of uh, of the of the shows. Yeah, and then um, yeah, I need to quick question. The other day, I was looking into my collection, and I, I don't think I have the, the that particular. You know, it wasn't Blu-ray. It could have been a regular DVD. I need to. Somehow get it, find a copy of that to, to see what it was like uh, back in the day, seeing that kind of I mean, everything now is in YouTube. I'm quite sure somebody uploaded that, yeah. but, uh, but I, I like to, um, you know, have um, copies and so on and so forth. And then in '95, although you, re you, know, you were officially left um, that can dance because of family commitment, I think Brenda and Lisa. I'm, invited you to be part of the recording session yeah so that that was a, yeah that that was a real thrill for me because obviously i'd been uh out of the situation for five years by that time and uh and i hadn't nothing i did so i i was really completely out of music altogether i didn't have any other projects going on at that time um and uh And I thought, yeah, I, you know, I just thought it was all over. I thought that my involvement had ended. And then one day Brendan phoned me up and uh, just said to me that he and Lisa were putting together a uh, percussion ensemble to uh, just record various backing tracks um, as, a, as a starting point for the, for the next Egg Can Dance album. And um, would I be interested in coming over to Quivy Studio in Ireland? Uh, and becoming one member of the percussion group the percussion ensemble that they were putting together to record these backing tracks so obviously i said well yes i'll be there that would be great amazing right. um yeah. and uh and so it was it was it was uh an absolute joy for me to be involved and go back and uh and also get to know the the other people who'd come into the setup by then who were uh, Uh, percussionists from uh, the Irish group Keela, who Brendan had uh, got to know in over in Ireland, and they absolutely brilliant musicians. Um, so it was a wonderful experience to work with them. Um, and uh, yeah, obviously Brendan and Lisa again, and Brendan's brother Robert was part of it. So we had a fantastic week, a real uh, a real joy, just spending all day uh, recording percussion sessions. And in the end, I two of those two of the tracks on the Spirit Chair album used percussion sections that uh, we recorded in those sessions. And also, there was uh, there was one track, a track called Samba Tiki, which was used on the two as as a like a prom a promotional CD that was uh, included in the tour program for the American tour in '96, um, which also had a I played on it was it was part of the uh, percussion sessions that we did at Quivy at that time. So yeah, it was it was fantastic to be involved again and uh, a real thrill for me personally. Good for you, man. And then I think now Lisa began very popular and a lot of people um, from the 
you know, film industry started going here, and then, then she released the album The Mirror Pool, and then she began working with yeah. Michael Mann, right, at the time? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, she'd struck up a relationship with Michael Mann and done the soundtrack for the uh, the Insider film. Um, yeah. And, and, yeah, he, he was very, very taken with her, and uh, she did a couple of other projects with with him she was doing one or two bits and pieces and then um and then obviously the big one came along in 2000 yeah we'll, we'll talk about that and then so they, they can then get it to the americas again but this time yeah. they play well north america they play in the close in washington dc as well canada north america canada yeah. north america and then brazil this is the first time they end up going to brazil argentina and and four gigs in in Mexico, believe it or not. Wow, amazing. Mm. Yeah. As we as we have done, you know, in the past, you know, uh, the contest is very, very, very popular in Latin America and all the countries. And uh, any whether whether they do one show or yeah. twenty shows in a row, they would be all sold out, right? So No, I know, and I'm I'm not sure I never really spoke to Brendan or Lisa about that. I don't know how that came about. I don't, I, I don't yeah. whether that's just uh, because a lot of people in, in Latin America follow what's going on in the American market and it yes. sort of filters through. Uh, I don't know. But, um, yeah, the popularity in, in Latin America is, uh, is quite extraordinary. It's, it's um, you know, fantastic. Yeah, but, um and also, I think uh, one of the tracks from the, the release is Spirit Chaser. I think the track is called Neureka. Uh, mm. At the time, won a, an annual award for the most played song in, in U.S. college radio. I believe it. kids in college were listening to <laughs> this yeah. at the time. And so, right. And it also got used as a soundtrack for uh, on the soundtrack of uh, a Mexican TV soap opera wow i didn't know that <laughs> wow amazing yeah and uh but don't ask me what the show is called because i can't i can't remember it's in the it's in the book it's in the book absolutely yeah it was it come from the book and then a couple of months after the tour you know bring brendan you know told you okay now i'm, I'm done with the tour i have some time and he began uh helping you with your recording and i think you end up booking like to Dublin and then uh, you guys the two of you yeah so right. it was when we were doing the when we were doing the percussion sessions uh, at Quivy for the Spirit Chaser album he suddenly uh, we were having a drink in one of the local bars one evening and uh, just chatting and he just suddenly said to me completely out of the blue are you still writing any any music because obviously he knew that I'd been write, writing stuff previously when I wrote Takahara's leaving an evocation. I had a few more songs that he knew of yeah. that I'd around that time. So I just sort of said, well, yeah, a little bit now and then, but nothing really serious. And uh, he said to me, well, um, if you can, if you can get together enough songs to, for an album, you can come over to Quivy and I'll record them for you. So I said, really? And he, he said, "Yeah, and um, uh, you know, I mean, that's that's a big commitment. That's a lot of a lot of his his time and uh, and an effort and input." So I, at the time, I thought, you know, maybe he's had a. I've got him well old with a few too many Guinnesses, and he's being a bit over um, <clears throat> uh, a, a bit over uh, um, over committing himself uh, to the, yeah. yeah. Um, after, after, three, and, after three drinks, you say yes to anything. Yeah, well, that's right. So, uh, so I checked again with him the following morning, but he said, no, 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 I'm completely serious if you want to do it. So I said, well, yeah, you know, it would be amazing. So, um, so yeah, so I was re-motivated and went away and started uh, writing songs again. And um, he then went off, you know, he had to finish the Spirit Chaser album and then they went and did the tour that you were just talking about. Um, but then when he when he came back, we he gave he got in touch and gave me some time, and I went over to Quivy, uh, I think three times in the end over a period of uh, three or four months, and um, yeah, we 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 put all the tracks down for the 
for my what became my first album. Um, and, right. and yep. you know, that was fantastic because he, he gave me his time. He gave me incredible input. He gave me the studio facilities. And without that, I would, you know, I would never have been able to do that. And that started me on my, you know, the path for my solo career after that. And it was, it was all down to his generosity. Um, I, yeah. Cause otherwise it, you know, without his inspiration and his input to that, it would never have happened. And then you, so you took that and you began sending that, uh, you began sending that to different record labels and how it was uh, received from those record labels? I think it was hard at the beginning, right? Yeah, it, again, it was, um, yeah, it was, it was very hard going. I, you know, I had a, I, I had this album of, uh, of eight songs, um, six that I'd done with Brendan and the two that I'd, I'd recorded before in 1990 um and i felt that it was a it was a really strong set of songs and brendan had done a fantastic production job on it and added some really beautiful bits of in instrumentation into it um and i started sending demos out to record companies and i was just getting um quite a few people coming back to me and saying Yes, it's really nice, but it's not for us. Um, and why don't you try this label or that label? Um, so I was just going going through the motions for months and months, probably over a, over a year in the end. Um, and eventually, the I had I had already sent a, a demo to the project label in the states. Yeah, um, but I was. I was talking to some friends in London uh, one time and um, one of them said to, said to me, you know, you really, the, the obvious label for this is, is project. And I said, yeah, but I've already sent to them and I never heard anything. And he just said to me, well, send it again. So I thought, oh, I never really thought about that was worth a try so i sent again to project and this time round um sam rosenthal who runs the label got back to me and uh said yeah it's really i really like this and like to do it so we <clears throat> quickly put an agreement together and that was that yeah then the album is called what pathways and dance Pathway right and yeah. Dawns, yeah. And dawns, this is correct yeah and then I think your promotion of that was uh, mainly geared towards uh, the United States market, right? It, is, it wasn't sell, was selling more United yes, States than in Europe. Yeah, right? yeah, because uh, obviously I'd, I'd had my brush with the UK market before and, and not yeah. found it uh, very, very accommodating. So, uh, um, um, yeah, Project's main base is, is, is in America with the... the the large uh, bulk of their market is in the states. So um, yeah, it was a you know that was a that was a really uh, good tie up for me. And um, so yes, most of the marketing was done by Project themselves over in the states. I mean, I still did some here in the UK, and yeah, we we got a few sales here, but uh, the the bulk of it was in the states. And also going out through Project had some overseas distributors, and one particular one in Europe that. Um, uh, covered the markets where Dead Can Dance had some, <clears throat> you know, was strong in in Europe, such as France and Germany and Netherlands and so on. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was a good uh, good arrangement, and I I really enjoyed being part of the project uh, roster, and I'm still good friends with uh, with Sam today. We're still in touch from time to time, and uh, good. yeah, it was a all good experience. Good, good for you. And then, so well. You were trying to promote your your own record. Lisa was doing the the Hollywood and the Michael Mann and all the different folks mm -hmm. began well, here to do soundtracks from one way or another. And Brenda then released a beautiful album called The Eye of the Hunter that was very well received. I, I really I really like the album. That's what uh, it's it's a stunning album. Yeah, I mean it's, it's <clears throat> it, it was really. Uh, his um, production techniques and his instrumentation and every the, the development of his voice, everything was just uh, um, you know going forwards in in leaps and bounds and uh, and yeah, I, it was it, it's an absolutely beautiful album and still is to this day, as you say. Yeah, yeah. No, so, so I, I listened to the album again. 
I don't have that. I, I have a lot of, you know, his stuff, the latest, but not that album. So, right. And I said, so it's very well put together. I really like that album. And mm -hmm. um, obviously the two of them are very, very talented. And so free to elaborate on how you, I think there's the different version of how, on how the Hans Zimmer heard of uh, Lisa's voice, but I think you have a good version. Oh, right, the, yeah. The, so, the accurate, you know, the, yeah, so the, the, the story, as I, as I tell it in the book, which I think is uh, is largely correct, there's a few sort of small details yeah. which I've heard differently in different versions, but essentially what happens is that um, Hans Zimmer was, had the, I mean, obviously he, he is the, the Mr. Big of Hollywood soundtracks and he gets the contracts to do many, many uh, right. soundtracks and he has a... A huge organization that works with him that uh you know it's quite an incredible setup um but he's very hands-on he's very personally involved in all the all the music that's uh, that's done as far as i can understand um so he had the contract uh, ridley scott was had been had got the studio contract to make the film gladiator Ooh. and um so they were working on it in the studios in la and Hans Zimmer was with the, the music. He was involved during the process of the, the film being made. He was working quite closely with Ridley Scott. I think they're pretty good friends. And, uh, and so he was, he was working <coughs> on it simultaneously. And um, he had originally, he, he wanted this, uh, what he thought of as, as being like a haunting female voice as, as part of the soundtrack. And he originally had in mind to use uh, the Israeli singer Ofra Haza. Um, but tragically, during the making of, of Gladiator, she suddenly died. She was only 42, I think, at the time. I don't know what the <coughs> uh, what caused it. But um, anyway, uh, obviously, that, um, that ended the idea of having having her involvement so he was sort of proceeding with the soundtrack and didn't really have a um a fixed idea as to whether he was going to replace her or or um or you know use a use another voice or use something go go in a completely different direction but then uh the story as i heard it was uh, he was working on the on the film one day and uh, there was a a, a, a production assistant and on the crew of the film had uh, had a like a ghetto blaster on the on the set and when they were taking a break for lunch he was playing this <clears throat> stuck this uh, dead can dance tape in the machine and um lisa's voice came over and wormed its way into hans zimmer's ear and he was suddenly struck by this voice and said to the guy what is that you're listening to so the technician told him and um he said to his uh, his right hand person on the on the set find me this singer and get her here so the uh, the assistant got on to 4ad and 4ad contacted lisa and said is there any chance you could uh pop over to hollywood for three days and um I do a do a contribution to a soundtrack with Hans Zimmer. So Lisa said, "Okay." So she got on the plane and went over there. And uh, and as soon as they met, they they just hit it off. They they got on really well. And he absolutely fell in love with her her voice. And um, instead of three days, she ended there for three months and did the wrote and recorded the entire soundtrack with him and got a co credit for it and the rest is history wow that's kind of was uh, a big point in her life because i think uh uh you know that her life uh, lisa gerard career changed mm. dramatically right and then she became world famous and of course gladiator yes. movie became a, a, a global smash and um, yeah, of course, yeah. it was absolutely huge, and uh, yeah. and so, <clears throat> um, 
yeah, and, I, I, and to this day, she's still touring with with Hans Zimmer from time to time, and uh, yeah. and and doing live performances of the of the Gladiator soundtrack, and uh, and uh, you know particularly the, uh, the the main theme song from it just crops up all over the place. You you know you just hear that everywhere. That's right, um, and my aunt, so, yeah, and yeah. Then she's going to be uh, touring with uh, Hans Zimmer. Uh, now I think she's in, in Dubai, and then she's going to be yeah. playing with Hansimer April, May, and part of June, I think. It's, and then I, I hopefully I can I can see her with with Hansimer as well, you know. I, uh, and uh, I think uh, I want to yeah. take a quote from your book. It says, "I think Hansimer said there there are a lot of extraordinary singers in the world, but there is no one like Lisa. She can move mountain with her voice. Wow, what about that? What a powerful!" Yeah, no, he, he, yeah, he absolutely eulogizes yeah. about her voice, and I think they've they've become very good friends as well. You know, they get on very well together. And uh, yeah. yeah, all right, Peter. I think we we went twenty now. We will reach an hour, and that was our agreement. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> make the interview short and, and enjoyable for people. Uh, yeah, yeah, we don't want people uh, nodding off. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Go. It was very nice talking to you. We, you know, we'll do a part four and part five, and it's very, very interesting. I'm very grateful for your time and insight. I'm very grateful for you. As long as you want to keep going, I'll be there. Oh, oh I have. And then we need to go over your career, and then you come into the United States, the other okay. album, and so forth. And uh, yeah, so we have a lot more to talk about, and we'll see each other uh, very right. soon in, uh, you know, in your country, man. Yes, looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Peter. It was very nice coming to you again. Thanks, Claudio. Bye. Thank you.